interviewing for the Oklahoma Christian Oklahoma Living Library, May 20th, 1970. I am talking to Dr. Paul Champlin of Enid, Oklahoma. Dr. Champlin, let's start from the very beginning of your life. Where were you born? And tell me something about your uh, mother and father and brothers and sisters. Um, I was born in a little town of Canton, Kansas, which is in McPherson County uh, in Kansas. Uh, my father was in the uh, hardware business. My mother uh, was raised in the in the community, um, but unfortunately, at a very early age, my mother passed away, and uh, I was taken to raise by my grandmother, uh, Mrs. Alice P. Champlin, who lived in uh, in uh, McPherson. Uh, uh, in McPherson County, Kansas. Uh, my grandmother, after raising six boys of her own, uh, who uh, six of them uh, settled in Oklahoma uh, at the shore, uh, at my mother's death, finally took. Uh, myself and my two older brothers to raise. Uh, we lived with her uh, up until the time that she passed away in uh, 1914, just six weeks before I graduated from high school. Uh, I um, uh, entered the Kansas University in 1914. Uh, graduated uh, from the uh, with a bachelor's degree in medicine in 1918. Um, immediately transferred to Washington University in uh, St. Louis and uh, uh, finished my medical or was graduated in 1920, uh, which was just 50 years ago. Uh, following my uh, uh, graduation, I spent uh, three years uh, in hospital training in St. Louis and finally uh, moved to Enid, Oklahoma in the year of uh, 1923. Um, during my childhood, um, uh, due to the fact that uh, my uh, grandmother had four sons who uh, lived in Oklahoma during the vacation in the summer and both at Christmas time. We uh, many times came to Enid on visits and also uh, went out down through the state to um, uh, the Anadarko, Holbert, Lawton, uh, where uh, her other sons lived at that time. Um, I, after practicing by myself for um, about one year, I became associated with Dr. S. N. Mayberry and Dr. D. D. Roberts at the University Hospital. Um, oh. After being with uh, Dr. Mayberry for about eight years, I decided that um, the, this part of the state was uh, uh, lacking in medical facilities in regard to the treatment of uh, uh, cancer. Uh, so I went back to New York and spent uh, almost an entire year at the Memorial Hospital for uh, Malignant Diseases. Following returning to Enid, I uh, put in the, uh, uh, I purchased the first radium and had the first uh, deep x-ray therapy machine in this part of the state. Uh, we, we continued doing uh, cancer work 
up until um, uh, the present time, uh, although um, my uh, amount of, of that type of work has um, decreased due to the fact that uh, there have been uh, three radiologists uh, moved into Enid uh, since the World War II. Uh, Very shortly, you're going to be celebrating an anniversary, is that correct? Uh, I'm um, returning to St. Louis uh, this next week for my 50th uh, class reunion uh, from the Washington University Medical School. Then you have seen a great deal of the progress of medicine in 50 years. The, um, the practice of medicine in 1923 was uh, uh, very, very interesting because uh, at the time we had so few effective drugs. I, um, in fact, is my professor of medicine once uh, uh, after, uh, during our senior year, we were to be graduated, and yet they had never taught us any uh, treatment. The uh, professor one day gave a lecture, at which time uh, he uh, wrote on the blackboard all the drugs that were uh, available that had uh, any very positive action. And uh, in that time, he mentioned that uh, there were only five Pacific drugs. Uh, by a Pacific drug, I mean one that uh, if you had a disease and you gave that drug, uh, it cured the disease. And uh, in 1923, we only had five. We had many drugs. Uh, altogether, there were only about 28 in the entire group. Uh, which uh, were of any uh, proven benefit uh, in, in definite diseases, the, uh, so that we were quite limited in, uh, in our scope of treatment. Uh, this, um, of course, may sound fantastic, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it was, um, uh, we were, since uh, since we started, since I started in the practice of medicine, uh, the first year that I was in Enid, I returned to St. Louis to to find out something about the use of insulin. It had only been developed uh, the uh, the year before. Uh, before insulin, all we could do is diet the patient, cut out the sugar. Their length of life was uh, very short, particularly in the younger individual. Um, by the use of insulin, we could prolong their life for many years. Um, we had no antibiotics. We had. Uh, no definite treatment for uh, superficial or serious infections. The mortality from appendicitis was, of ruptured appendices was about 30 percent. Um, I would hesitate to, uh, to uh, guess how many patients that I had lost from ruptured appendices. Uh, this continued on until uh, the last patient that I've ever lost from acute appendicitis was almost uh, 30 years ago. Um, before that, we didn't, uh, we did not have uh, uh, the sulfur drugs. We had no antibiotics whatsoever. Uh, the treatment of uh, serious infections was uh, a very difficult job. We saw a great deal of typhoid, diphtheria. Uh, we had no mass immunization of children for, for whooping cough, diphtheria, tetanus. Uh, we did have the, uh, 
the the smallpox uh, and we did have the typhoid inoculation for the prevention of typhoid. Uh, of course, uh, what kind of treatment did you prescribe for diphtheria or typhoid? Of course, uh, the treatment for uh, diphtheria, we had the, uh, the antitoxin uh, after the patient uh, got the diphtheria. Then you could immediately give the, uh, the antitoxin. I well remember one case in my early career, which I went out to see a child uh, with diphtheria. The, uh, the patient, uh, uh, I went to the drugstore to get the antitoxin, but uh, uh, at the time we had a faith healer here in town who, who um, uh, persuaded this woman that, uh, that the antitoxin was poison, and she called me at the drugstore and told me not to c come back. Uh, Five days later, the telephone rang in the middle of the night, and and uh, some woman answered or uh, talked on the phone, said that she's gone, and, and I immediately asked, "Who's gone?" She says, "Well, uh, Mary uh, is gone," and I said, "Well, Mary, who?" And she says, "You remember you were out here to see her with diphtheria. This child, I'm sure, could be." cured by antitoxin, but due to uh, her religious scruples, she failed to uh, allow me to give the antitoxin, and the child expired. Then you made house calls. Uh, we all made house calls. Uh, at that time, the, even the most prominent doctors in town made house calls. The reason for it was that uh, in as much as... <coughs> Because all these, um, and the doctors who graduated in 1905 and 6 were at the peak of their profession in 1923 to 1930, and there were only a uh, few of the doctors who were busy all the time. The rest of us were sitting around uh, in our office just waiting for the patients to come in. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Champlin, uh, do you feel that when you first started medicine that some of the small towns were able to receive uh, good medical care? The, uh, of course, the, the type of medical care they received was uh, uh, of the times because many of these doctors uh, in these small towns had had inferior education from inferior medical schools but nevertheless, they were licensed to practice. Uh, besides that, there were still a few of the doctors here uh, in 1923 that uh, were, um, were uh, licensed by what we know as the grandfather clause. Uh, they, um, uh, they had uh, set up to practice medicine without any medical education whatsoever. And yet, when the uh, when the uh, we came into statehood, they were immediately licensed just because they were practicing at the time, uh, which is the same thing that happened to lawyers and other professions at the same time. But many of these had learned all their practice uh, out of uh, uh, out of their experience and the reading of their books and. Uh, their contact uh, uh, with other doctors, both uh, at the hospital and um, at the uh, medical meetings. You mentioned a Dr. Mayberry uh, earlier. Would you like to comment about um, some work that he did in Enid, a contribution that he made? Uh, Dr. Mayberry was uh, another doctor who uh, who had a, in present day standards, had a very inferior education. He um, 
he uh, graduated uh, from a medical school in St. Louis. I've forgotten exactly the name of the school. Uh, he went back there for about three to six months for three years hand running and then uh, started to practice with a doctor up in uh, southern Kansas. He finally moved to uh, Wacomus. Uh, after a year or two there, he came to Enid and uh, with his brother Ed uh, established what was uh, then about the first hospital in Enid called the University Hospital. It was uh, associated with uh, Phillips University. Dr. Mayberry um, uh, did uh, all, uh, all types of uh, medical practice. He uh, uh, first started in by having uh, a surgeon come down from uh, Wichita, Kansas to assist him in his surgery, uh, gradually developing his technique uh, to where he was doing practically all types of surgery. Uh, uh, and of course he was doing a very good job with the uh, limited uh, 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 oh, hey, Barry was in practice with his brother Ed who uh, expired uh, sometime in about 1910 or 12, he continued on, uh, was associated with Dr. Roberts in about after World War I, and um, I joined with Dr. Mayberry in 1925. Now, I know having been in the profession for 50 years, you certainly uh, have taken upon some leadership. Would you care to comment on some of the the organizations that you have joined? I've, I've been active always in the uh, in the uh, uh, professionally, of course, in the uh, in the Garfield County Medical Society. I used to be um, a secretary to start with. Uh, served two terms as president of the County Medical Society. Uh, later I became uh, head of the Cancer Committee of the Oklahoma State Medical Society and uh, uh, was elected president of the Oklahoma State Medical Society in 1947 to serve uh, in 1947 and 48. Um, I helped reorganize the American Division of the American, or the the uh, Oklahoma Division of the American Cancer Society, and uh, at the same time, I was one of the uh, original uh, directors of the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Do you think that the uh, era of the small town doctors is just something of the past? Uh, the uh, the small down doctor is more or less uh, a thing of the past for the simple reason that the, uh, for two reasons. One is a terrific shortage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, medical personnel. Uh, after uh, a modern day medical student, after he spends uh, four years in college, four years in the university, five years in academic training, uh, can go any place and uh, make a, and due to the fact of the shortage, he can go any place and make an adequate living. Uh, the, um, a doctor in a small town uh, can make a, a, can make a, uh, a great deal of uh, money from uh, from his practice, but uh, being as well educated as he is, and uh, uh, neither he nor his wife uh, will isolate themselves out into a, a, a community. Um, I suppose another reason is that a good doctor in a small town is so terrifically overworked that uh, it's almost um, impossible to withstand the pressure 
I've seen several of the boys, uh, young fellows, in uh, medicine just leave because they uh, said that the, they had no time to themselves whatsoever. They were tied down so tight. Uh, they just disregarded the financial uh, side of it and decided they was going someplace, uh, go into a, a, prof uh, especially where they wouldn't uh, have to work so hard. You were speaking about families uh, living in small towns, uh, the doctors and their wives. Um, would you like to comment on your own family? Um, I um, was married in 1925 to Adeline Johnson, uh, who was uh, uh, a... Um, who had uh, gone to Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma University. Uh, our first child was born, Rosemary, in 1927. She is now married to uh, uh, Mr. Jack Graves, lives in Oklahoma City. Um, her husband is an architectural engineer. Uh, my son, um, was born in 1935, eight years later. Uh, he is um, um, he is now a lawyer. He's the, the general counsel for Leeway for Motor Freight in Oklahoma City. Uh, they are both doing very well. My daughter has uh, uh, three uh, three children uh, or four children. Um, the oldest one is nine, the twins are eight, and the little boy is five. My son has uh, three children. The oldest uh, girl is eight, the next one is uh, six, and the, the baby uh, boy is uh, about three months old. They are um, living in the city at the time. Uh, unfortunately, my wife uh, developed the dread disease of cancer and expired uh, in 1967. Uh, I, about two years later, I then was married to my, uh, uh, the widow of my oldest brother and uh, we are living in the unit together at the present time. All right, Dr. Tamplin, I think it's time for a little reminiscing. Let's go back to when you were a child and you first came to Oklahoma. Tell us about uh, your experiences with maybe the Indians, uh, transportation, uh, perhaps some games or uh, the type of... Uh, social life that you led? Just reminisce. Well, um, the first uh, memorable thing that uh, happened uh, that I can remember about Oklahoma was uh, back in the days when they had the, uh, the difficulty with the Rock Island Railroad where the passenger trains would not stop in, uh, in Enid, but they uh, would stop in North Enid. Um, and I well remember taking a horse and buggy uh, from uh, from uh, North Enid into Enid. Uh, one of the vivid things I remember they used to have a, uh, that brings comes to memory is that they had a yeast factory somewhere halfway between the two uh, two cities, and this must have been. Uh, not over 10 years uh, after the opening of the Cherokee Strip. Um, as, a, as a boy coming here for, on a vacation, uh, the streets were not paved around the square. The, uh, everybody was, uh, the few cars in town, uh, the um, the um, uh, 
Most people had their uh, horse and buggy that they depended on for transportation. The um, Another uh, very interesting episode that I well remember is uh, going with my grandmother down to visit my uh, uncle uh, uh, Robert Champlin, who was running a lumber yard in Anadarko. We stayed at the hotel. Uh, one day I um, um, went with uh, Uncle Bob to the lumber yard and uh, on the after becoming uh, tired I decided to walk three blocks down Main Street uh, to back to the hotel of course when I was a child all the stories and all the legends and the uh, the uh, related to uh, to not only tales of the Civil War, the the Indian Wars, and the uh, and the Spanish American War. The uh, so therefore, in ta reading about all the Indian atrocities, made me very fearful of Indians. On the way back from the uh, lumberyard to the hotel, uh, I. Uh, a, uh, about eight or ten Indians were riding bareback down the, uh, the main street with their braids hanging down their back, uh, riding bareback in single file. Uh, I immediately become so um, frightened that I ran and hid under a culvert. Uh, I'm sure they didn't see me because they uh, certainly uh, caused me no harm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, you mentioned about your grandmother having raised you after raising six of her own boys, uh, and uh, it sounds that most of the boys came to Oklahoma. Did they come during any of the runs or the um, Cherokee Strip opening? Uh, my um, my uh, father uh, made the uh, the run in 1893 uh, into Pond Creek, Oklahoma, but after spending about two days there, he decided that it wasn't for him, so he went back to a uh, little town of Canton, Kansas, to his uh, hardware store. Uh, Mr. H. H. Champlin, who is the founder of the Champlin Refining Company, and uh, uh, with his brother Fred Champlin, uh, made the run. Uh, well, uh, correction there. Uh, Mr. H. A. Champlin made the run in 1889 into Kingfisher at the time of the Oklahoma Territory was first uh, open. Uh, he, he filed on a claim in in town. Uh, later, he moved back. Uh, to McPherson where he went into the banking business. Uh, then again in 1893 he with his brother Fred um, uh, made the run into Enid. Uh, Uncle Fred settled on a claim. H. H., uh, Mr. H. H. Chaplin uh, took a, um, a job in the um, or, or, and with his, uh, Mr. H. H. Chaplin, uh, uh, with his brother Fred, established a bank in the um, in a tent uh, at the, the day after the run. Uh, about one year later, after they had moved into uh, adequate quarters, uh, they both uh, took sick with typhoid fever. Uh, my grandmother came to Enid. Uh, and uh, uh, got them, took them back to uh, McPherson, at which time uh, she nursed them uh, through uh, their sickness. Uh, later, they both uh, came back to Enid and again went into banking business together. Later, uh, Mr. Fred Champlin 
went into to the um, insurance business, abstract business. Uh, he later returned uh, to the bank and was vice president of the First National Bank at the time he died. Mr. H. H. Champlin uh, uh, sold the bank uh, in about 1897 or 8, uh, went in uh, went into the uh, lumber business, following the hardware business. Later, he bought back into the bank in 1909 um, and continued in the banking business uh, until the time of his death. In 1916, I happened to be in Enid uh, one summer, at which time uh, I accompanied him uh, and one of his friends uh, to the town of Billings, Oklahoma, where they, the first uh, oil well, uh, oil production was started. And uh, at the time, of course, everybody was overjoyed. My uncle um, uh, had some interests uh, around, and uh, of course, he, he had a beautiful uh, Palm Beach suit and a Panama hat, and they, everybody went wild, throwing oil all over him. He ruined, <laughs> it, ruined his entire suit. Uh, I was a um, a junior in the uh, in the university at the time. Uh, later, in 1917, uh, uh, he. Um, uh, hold on. 1917 and 1918, he uh, uh, bought a lease in the uh, Garber Covington field uh, and uh, drilled it himself and uh, found production. Had difficulty uh, selling his oil, so he immediately uh, established a small refinery in Enid, at which time he um, uh, uh, refined his own oil. And, uh, following this, uh, um, the, uh, this was the beginning of the uh, Champlin Refining Company, which is uh, now part of the Union Pacific Railroad Company. So um, it started uh, from a uh, expenditure of thirty, forty thousand dollars in 1916, up until the time they sold out to the Chicago Corporation in 1954 for something like 55 million. Um, the um, uh, the third uh, son uh, was A. R. Champlin, who uh, uh, went to Kansas University in about 1890. Was on the uh, one of the first football teams for for the uh, Kansas University. Uh, later, uh, was an engineer. He moved to Newton, Kansas. At uh, which time he installed a telephone system in Newton uh, and ran the first uh, telephone wire between Newton and Wichita. Um, he sold out uh, to the Southwestern Bell Telephone Company in 19, uh, approximately 1910 or 11, and moved to California. He's list he's, uh, he lived uh, around Sacramento until his death in 1924. Um, Roy Ch uh, Fred Champlin, as I told you, uh, was uh, vice president of the First National Bank, highly respected individual in the community, um, uh, passed away in about 1938, leaving five children. Uh, one of them, well, uh, Lloyd Champlin uh, uh, was in the lumber business in um, in uh, Lawton, Oklahoma. Was the father of nine children. I think uh, all of them are graduates of Oklahoma University. Uh, his wife is the only one of the original widows who is still alive. 
uh, and uh, she must be over 90 years old. The um, <coughs> Robert Champlin was in the lumber business in Anadarko, later in the um, lumber business in Hobart, uh, was president of the bank in Roosevelt, uh, Sentinel finally moved uh, back to Enid in about 1925 or six. I was associated with uh, Mr. H. H. Champlin for several years in the oil business, finally establishing a lumber yard uh, here in Enid. My father, Joe, was the oldest of the six boys. Uh, he um, uh, continued uh, with a hardware store in a little town of Canton, Kansas, which is in McPherson County, uh, very close to uh, the place where his father and mother uh, moved to from Illinois in 1873. They bought uh, the, uh, some railroad land from the, uh, from the Santa Fe Railway. Uh, they finally um, uh, got uh, they finally uh, purchased other land they, and uh, after about 15 years he moved into uh, into McPherson at, where, at, uh, at the time he was elected county treasurer of Mc, McPherson County uh, my grandfather um, Charles A. Champlin was a veteran of the Civil War, receiving uh, uh, two medical discharges, one at the, uh, at the Battle of Shiloh and the other, the other at the Battle of Vicksburg. Fortunate enough to have, um, have uh, his medical discharge papers in my possession. Uh, also, um, uh, his final pension papers. The, um, well, Dr. Champlin, it's very easy to see that are not only you a uh, living legend in the history of Oklahoma, but also the entire family, Champlin family. I think your grandmother has raised some very fine boys, her six sons and uh, her three grandsons. Thank you very much for the interview. It's been a pleasure. This is Hilda Lauber. I am interviewing for the Oklahoma Christian College for the Oklahoma Living Legends Library. The date is May 20th, and today we are interviewing Gaynell Gittle. We are in Enid, Oklahoma. Gaynell, I understand that you've been around uh, Enid for quite a little yes. while. Yes, we came here in 1905. Uh, wait a minute. Yes, 1905. <laughs> My father was connected with the Frisco Railroad. We had lived in Kansas and in Missouri. I was born in Missouri, September 1st, 1897. My brother was born in Kansas in 1902. Uh, you need to mention those kids or not. I, um, when you left Kansas, did you come directly to uh, Enid? We came directly to Enid and we dro rode the train and we had never seen so many windmills as we saw en route. We counted them and we counted 78 between Neodice, Kansas and Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, after we came to Oklahoma, I had uh, another brother and two sisters, uh, all of us, attended school in Enid, all graduated from high school, and my youngest sister graduated from Phillips University here in Enid. Uh, are we going over? Oh, all right, all right. I forget. Yes. Uh, I worked for the telephone company uh, long enough to um, get my tuition to the um, Enid Business College. 
I worked for several companies before going to OG&E in 1927. At that time, Mr. Bierbauer was the manager. The telephone company had sent me to Oklahoma City to work, and then I was to go to Tulsa thereafter. But Mrs. Bierbauer and my mother, being good friends, they hatched up the plan that I should work for OG&E when Mr. Bierbauer found a place for me, which he did in 1927. I was to be his secretary. However, the girl whose place I was to take decided not to quit, so I was put into the um, contract department, which I didn't care for because I met the public, and it wasn't the type of work I was accustomed to doing. So I was looking around for something else when um, a job appeared in the engineering department. They were looking for someone, and so somebody said, well, why don't you take what you got? You got Gaynell there, and she can do what you want. So I was transferred to the engineering department and continued in that department until my retirement, September 1st, 1962. I enjoyed my work thoroughly with the OG&E. When I got uh, into the engineering department, we had just taken over uh, about 26 towns uh, in northern Oklahoma that had uh, been uh, established, the system, the distribution systems had been established by um, a company called United, and the og and &E had bought them out. And uh, it was fell to my lot to help uh, record all their uh, systems and put them on the maps and that sort of thing. Gunnell, what kind of a title did you have with og and &E? uh, Originally, I was just a clerk. Uh, eventually, I was secretary, and uh, in the last phase of my work there, I was uh, called an engineer's aide. One, I think, of the few, if maybe only the one, engineer's aide who was a woman. And uh, through the years, I learned the engineering business to such an extent that I carried the load of a man, really. However, um, I didn't always receive the pay of a man because girls didn't get that kind of pay. <laughs> Working for utilities, I imagine that uh, you were pretty busy during a storm. I know Enid has uh, had their share of storms up here. Can you relate any interesting uh, experiences? Yes, we've had a number of storms that were pretty bad. But one time we were uh, plagued by ice. The wind would um, blow the conductors together, and then they would burn down, and we'd have to repair them. Uh, any person who works at OG&E is always aware of continuity of service, so everybody is on the job at a time like that. Our first uh, duty is to get service restored. We had lines feeding from the south, lines feed, uh, feeding in from the east, and we thought surely it would carry the town. but. Uh, First one line would go out and get it repaired, and maybe before it was thorough or completely repaired, the other one would go out. We had the north and south line. We felt since the storm was coming from the north that it wouldn't bother the north-south line. It wouldn't be across it. But we had one mile in that line, which was east and west, and it went out. And Enid was without service for two hours and 43 minutes. Um, I, be, I was um, the only woman in the operating department for quite a few years, and uh, our headquarters were at what we call the gas house. It had been a gas manufacturing plant at one time, but it had been converted to offices, so we all referred to it as the gas house. So, being the only gal out there, I was called gas house Gertie <laughs> by a lot of them, you know. But Gas House Gertie was on the emergency list, same as anybody else. So when an emergency arose, I was called the same as the men were, because I did much of the work inside, the telephoning and um, um, assembling crews sometimes, and dispatching outside crews that came in that didn't know where to go would help. In the one storm I remember, I appeared at six each morning and helped uh, dispatch the crews. Crews came in from. Oklahoma City, and I think even as far south as Ardmore, they didn't know which way to go to get the Hunter or Helena or something, so I would help dispatch them, keep track of the number of men on the crew, and so we keep track of their time. Then at 8 o'clock, I went to the engineering department, 
And there we worked all day trying to assemble what had happened the day before and make sketches and uh, material lists for new breaks in places where poles were out. Then at, um, in the evening, I'd run these sketches on the uh, Osled machine so that they could be sent to the um, um, storeroom for the material to be assembled along with the sketch. And I'd work for about four days. I worked from six to 10. When I got my salary check, I thought they'd made a mistake. Got so much money. <laughs> um, one thing I did at the OG&E, uh, about, uh, oh, I guess I'd been here about a month when the uh, manager, Mr. Beerbauer, asked me if I would write their news. Well, I was obligated to him, of course. I had my job through him, so I said, yes, I would. Then our paper was called Sparks and Flashes. It was a um, uh, mimeograph sheet for distribution around in Enid and uh, the division. Eventually, it was uh, included in the meter, which is the overall company paper. Now, I continued to write the news for me until my retirement in 1962. I guess I have the, um, I don't know, questionable title of being the one that would ha hang on the longest in <laughs> such a tough job. <laughs> but I was, um, I enjoyed the work, and uh, well, I remember they gave me a um, traveling case when I had written 25 years, I believe it was. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, the work. It wasn't anyf anything that I would complain about. How long did you work for OG&E? Uh, 35 years and five months, I believe it was, that I worked for OG&E. What was the date of your retirement, do you remember? Uh, September 1st, 1962. Uh, at the end, yeah, 35 years and five months is what it was, I believe. Um, since your retirement, have you taken many vacations, uh, or um, are you uh, one of these people that plan trips all through your life? Well, I've traveled rather extensively while I worked, and uh, since I've retired, that's one of my ambitions to travel, and I've done quite a little of it. We go to the East Coast quite often, and uh, I go about twice a year to see my brother in Flagstaff and my sister in Palm Springs. And uh, we hope to go to the coast this year. And while I worked, uh, we did went to Pacific Northwest. We went to um, Canada. During the war, we were up in uh, Montreal and Quebec. And I can remember seeing all kinds of service people in Canada, even to some uh, Aussies, you know, with the hat yes. turned up the yes. side. Mm -hmm. And um, in Montreal, there was an MP, and it was a woman, and she was about six foot two, and she was built with it, and she was directing everybody at the station. That was the first time I ever saw a woman MP. <laughs> All right. Uh, two different years, uh, we went to, Can uh, to um, Europe. The first time we went, we went uh, by boat, my sister and I, with four friends, and. Um, did one section, and then in 1957, five years later, uh, my sister and I went, uh, just the two of us, six people is too many. And um, we went, uh, uh, the second time, we took in other countries. We loved Europe, and I should like to go back to the Scandinavian countries, but I'm not sure I'm going to get there. <laughs> Well, Ganelli, you have mentioned your brothers and sisters and uh, some of the uh, enjoyable times you've had with them. Are either of your parents still living? Uh, my father died uh, 25 years ago, and uh, my mother is still living. She is 90, and she's bright and alert. She had her 90th birthday, August 20th, and uh, friends came by to congratulate her, and I said, well, I'm sorry about that, but she has gone to Garden Club. <laughs> <laughs> Rather funny thing about Mama, uh, she uh, fainted, and we're frightened to death because of her age that she may fall and hurt herself. We thought maybe she'd had a stroke, and we rushed her to the hospital. The boys came out in the ambulance, and it's kind of an old ramble shack rambly thing, shackly or whatever, and uh, on the way down, here we thought she'd fainted or something. She said, you boys have either got... <laughs> 
a flat tire or something. This thing doesn't ride very well, and they thought the old lady was out of her mind, but she really wasn't. <laughs> All right, let's back up a little bit. Uh, we talked about your education, your first coming to Enid. Uh, we did not mention at all um, the religious aspect of your life. Uh, what um, uh, denomination do you belong to? I belong to the Episcopal denomination now. However, originally, when, we were, when I was about three, our grandmother, my father's mother, came to live with us. She was a staunch Methodist. In fact, my father's name was John Wesley. She had a second son whose name was Edward Finley, and I think he too was a good Methodist. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but grandmother saw that we went to church, and uh, they tell that I was not potty broken when she took me to church the first time, and that was in Kansas. And um, I can remember so well uh, when I was in Sunday school in Kansas, they're singing, bringing in the sheaves. And I always thought they meant bringing in the sheets, and I have wondered and wondered why. <laughs> but Grandmother was a very faithful Methodist, and when we came to Enid, uh, we went to the Methodist church, and she saw that we were um, taken to revival meetings and all, and I went down one time, and I was baptized on... Uh, July 29th, 1906. I wasn't sure what it was all about, but the other kids went down, so I did too. And that was the way I became a Methodist. Our mother uh, had gone to the Episcopal Church when she was a girl, and uh, when we got to Kansas, there was no Episcopal Church there, but there was one when we came to Enid. So she, mother went there from time to time, and finally all of us went over there. Uh, and I think I must have been, oh, it must have been about 1912, when some kids I knew belonged to Episcopal Church and took me over there. So after that, I went all the time. Uh, about broke my grandmother's heart, but we finally went into the church. And um, they needed somebody to teach Sunday school, so I started teaching Sunday school uh, about 1915. Golly, about 55 years ago. <laughs> I uh, wasn't even confirmed yet. I think it was confirmed in 1918. But like the media correspondent bit, I stayed with it. And so I think I've taught around, well, give me 50 years because uh, the last two or three years I haven't taught. But uh, I'm going into the history of the Sunday School a bit, and I find out that it was the first organization in St. Matthew's Church. It was established in 1895 or 6. There are two different records of it and they disagree but apparently it was the first organization and it had 15 children in it uh it has i should judge uh, well i'm afraid to say how many there are now I, I really don't know because i haven't checked lately but uh in about 1909 uh, a mrs southard came to enid uh one of god's gentle women and she herded the Sunday school for years and years, and she died in about 1942. Uh, by then, I was working at it pretty faithfully, and so I sort of inherited her job as superintendent and secretary and all that sort of thing. But uh, in the early days, there was only just the church. We had nothing but uh, uh, the pews for our classrooms, and we would space them two or three pews apart, and there'd be a big buzz when during Sunday school when all the classes were meeting. First, we didn't have uh, money enough for good material, but eventually we did, and uh, we did the best with what we could. And uh, we feel that St. Matthew's Church School has been a success. There are lots of funny things that we could tell you about it, but as a whole, we think it's been a success. One of the things that um, this church school always did was have a pageant at Christmas time. And uh, the little ones would be, little boys would be shepherds, little girls would be angels, and then the fifth and sixth graders would take the parts of Mary and Joseph and uh, all the others that were needed. The little ones were um, costumed, the boys especially, were costumed in, costumed in burlap bags turned inside out to look, uh, oh, to resemble skins, you know, or rough clothing. And when the children were... Uh, dressed for the pageant. Everybody who helped were warned to turn the sack inside out. One time, one got through, and as he 
walked into the spotlight, Herod said on his back, Idaho potatoes. <laughs> um, so some of the sixth grade boys would always be wise men and bring the gifts, of course. And uh, they were never wise men to each other. They were wise guys. And uh, one year, some fellow thought we ought to have crooks for the little shepherds, and so we did. And when the wise guys got up to present the gifts, uh, the little shepherds tried to hook the wise guys and trip them. So we only used those uh, crooks one year. And one year, we had three wise men, and on the day of rehearsal, one did not appear. So hurriedly, we... Uh, got another boy to take the place, and at that night we had three wise men and three gifts. The last minute, a fourth boy, the original boy, came, and fortunately he was vested or uh, costumed, and he came. And what do you do with four wise men? Well, we got him a gift, and he went down. And we were all ready, because the Bible doesn't say there were three wise men, there were three gifts. Wise men came, but it never says how many. So that was that. <laughs> Another time, the angel Gabriel announced to the shepherd uh, that um, there was the coming of the, uh, the infant Jesus, and he had on a brand new wristwatch, and it glistened in the light. And then another time, uh, the little girl who was to be the Virgin Mary, a dear child, we said, uh, you are to be the Virgin Mary this year. And she said, goody, goody, I've always wanted to be a virgin. <laughs> Another traditional thing at St. Matthew's Church has been the Easter egg hunt. Uh, at first, it was um, held at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Fred Miller. Then it was taken to the lawn of the church. The children have a great deal of fun and enjoy the Easter egg hunt very much. One year, uh, one of the children found an egg that had been that they failed to find the year before, and we knew it was a year old from the older. <laughs> Another time, uh, we always asked the congregation to bring us died, I mean, um, boiled eggs, and then the older children have the fun of having a dying party, and uh, then they also help hide the eggs for the children. Somebody failed to dye their eggs, and you can imagine what a mess that was. Uh, afterward, uh, when the church was extended and uh, absorbed the yard, we went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Joe Myberg in about five miles north of town. We lived on a big acreage, and we had a lot of fun out there. But the thing has been very fine because the children of all ages uh, were able to participate, the older ones to help the little ones, and the little ones to have some help they needed. Uh, apparently, you felt that uh, along with Sunday school, your youngsters should have some kind of a social opportunity, that the church should provide this. Can you think of any other social activities? Well, on occasion, we would have um, ha Halloween parties, and uh, the children loved them. Sometimes they'd get horribly frightened, you know, the little ones, but uh, we could talk them out of that. But I've, I've always felt that they needed the social contact uh, with the others in their classes as we went along. We had Christmas parties uh, some of the time, but we felt that they should give rather than receive. And uh, when we had these pageants, we would bring white gifts, uh, and they were taken to the um, uh, state school for the retarded children, you know. And uh, on more than one occasion, we would see a child take his white gift down. It was supposed to be a brand new toy. He'd take it down and set it down and stand there and look at it, and then Mom would have to come and get him and take him back to his seat because he wouldn't leave it. <laughs> it sounds like your youth program uh, during the early days of the church consisted of all ages. I suppose as time went by, you did have your junior high groups, your, your high school groups. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, I would like to comment to this uh, extent that so many times, it may be true in other churches as well as St. Matthew's, uh, we'd groom them for their confirmation. And they would think then they knew all and they were too smart to come to church school. The consequent was always hard to have a, a high school class and... Uh, our youth groups have been sort of hit and miss, sometimes pretty strong, 
And uh, sometimes we've had all of them together, and sometimes we've divided by um, junior high and high school, sort of depending on our supply of youth, really. <laughs> Being a Sunday school teacher for 50 years, you have certainly seen uh, several generations of youngsters go through the church. Uh, is there anyone in particular that you feel uh, has made a good contribution to uh, our Christian society? Any at all? <laughs> uh, a number of the boys and girls uh, who have gone through the church school have uh, gone out into very good positions. I can't remember any of them ever becoming politicians, however, but I do know that some of them have become church school teachers, and yes, one has become a priest. I remember now, uh, Vern Jones out at Woodward was in our church school, and I'd kind of forgotten Jar Vern as having been there. But um, I do feel that uh, all of them have received something from the church. Uh, there's one thing I've noticed throughout the years. Some of the boys and girls who are erratic in their attendance now have children who are erratic in their attendance. <laughs> Over the 50-year period, uh, did you notice a great deal of difference uh, in the teaching of uh, the Episcopal religion in Sunday school? Yes, I've noticed a great deal. In the early day, we didn't have very good material. I don't know whether it was because the church didn't buy it or not. We sort of uh, worked on the, what we could find and oh, improvised quite a little. And then uh, we got the Episcopal uh, Church's teaching series. Then, uh, as you may remember, we uh, revised our teaching series. It, the other had gotten so old, they thought, they revised it. Well, they revised it so far out that a lot of the teachers didn't like it. It uh, had to do with their imagination, and some of them didn't have it. They didn't have the leadership, and consequently, it uh, didn't prove uh, exactly what the church had hoped it would. It has since been revised, and uh, more nearly, I think, is what they intended it to be, but it was something of a failure at first, we felt. I don't know too many people who have had a day named after them, and I know that there is a Ganell um, Gettel Day. It was celebrated some time ago. Would you like to comment? Tell us something about that. Well, I've always said, you know, I've taught Sunday school a hundred years, and somebody took me up at it and got to figuring out and uh, figured out I had about that. <laughs> Only it was about 45, I think, then. But uh, they got the notion that they would honor me one day, and uh, it was a surprise. And the uh, rector uh, declared, made a proclamation that this was Gay El Gattel Day, and I was called up front. And uh, he gave me the proclamation, and he also gave me uh, silver dollars representing one for each year I'd taught. And when I counted them, there were 45. And friends, those silver dollars are valuable now. They don't make them, and you can't get one even at a bank. <laughs> I, I know uh, that your heart was really uh, in the Sunday school at St. Matthew's, but I'm sure you did some other work, and you have some other stories about the St. Matthew's Church, the building, some of the rectors that have served there. Of St. Matthew's, one has never been written. And um, the history of St. Matthew's starts with the town of Enid. Bishop Brooke, who had been a bishop only about six months, came into what was north, what be, later became North Enid, but where the railroad stopped, from uh, Kansas. He came in on Saturday, which was the day of the run. He slept on a load of lumber.